You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Friday the 2nd of August 2013. Soldier was attacked in an Exeter underpass by a gang who chanted Lee Rigby. Daniel Pelker's mother and stepfather jailed for at least 30 years. Ten men charged with sexual exploitation of teens. Finally, Asian footballer jailed after racist tirade against match referee. Arrested man whose mosque boom tattoo incites racial hatred. Bank of England helped Reichsbank sell its Nazi gold. French deemed too lazy for Swiss recruiters. Germany, oil under Brandenburg, could deliver billions. Mozart on the beast itself. Egyptian army restoring democracy, says John Kerry. Iran state TV, Rouhani's comments on Israel removal were distorted. A joke for the weekend, the word of God. UK News. There is a stop press for the UK News. A soldier was attacked in an Exeter underpass by a gang who chanted Lee Rigby as they kicked him onto the floor. The 18-year-old, known as Alexander, had been a member of the Coldstream Guards for six months. But en route to his home in St Thomas, Exeter, he was targeted by the hateful mob as he is serving member of the armed forces. The incident happened just before 2pm on Wednesday afternoon. He said, I was walking home from the train station at Exeter Central and got to the ruins at X Bridge. As I went into the underpass, a group of lads walked past me. They stopped and asked if I was on the forces if I was in the forces. I replied yes, and before I could say why, fists were coming towards my face. I crawled up in a ball but couldn't get up. One was trying to get a screwdriver out of his pocket. I managed to get him off and fight him off. After managing to escape and run off, Alex was left with a split lip, sore ribs and a swollen jaw. He was treated at the NHS walk-in centre. I've only been in the army six months, but this is the first time anything like this has happened. I was very shaken up by it, but I'm starting to get to grips with what happened. Police are appealing for witnesses to the incident. A spokesman said the victim has described the main offender as mixed race with camouflage clothing, six foot five inches tall, heavy build, wearing a black tracksuit, and had his face covered. He was accompanied by seven others. Anyone who witnessed anything in the area at the time or knows who is responsible should contact the police on 101, quoting reference number DE forward slash 13 forward slash 7080. Daniel Pelker's mother and stepfather jailed for at least 30 years. The headline says enough as Mrs Justice Cox, the judge in the case, said she had not observed a single sign of remorse from Magdalena Lucic and Marius Kresilek, who subjected the youngster to months of harrowing abuse. World of Date comments, poor little Daniel, but surely his school should have done something. This case is very similar but much more highly reported than the Muslim woman who starved her small daughter to death and fed her salt as well. What is wrong with these people? Daniel's father is back in Poland and said he would have taken him back if asked, but he shouldn't have left him with this woman in the first place. He has remarried and seems happy, but at what cost? Both the accused should be deported back to Poland to serve their sentence, not in the UK. Ten men charged with sexual exploitation of teens. Ten men accused of sexually exploiting teenage girls have been charged with offences including rape, sexual assault and trafficking, police said Friday. The suspects, aged between 19 and 30, were charged Thursday following an investigation into alleged abuse in Coventry, West Midlands, police said. The men are all accused of exploiting at least five vulnerable local girls between May and September last year, a spokesman for the force said. The girls were all aged between 16 and 18 at the time of the alleged attacks. Brothers Gulfraz Benaris, 20, Ifaraz Benaris, 25, from Wood End, and Ithkab Benaris, 24, from Coventry, were charged with conspiracy to traffic girls for the purposes of sexual exploitation. Gulfraz and Ithkab were also both accused of rape. All three appeared before Coventry magistrates on Thursday and were remanded in custody to appear at Coventry Crown Court on November the 7th. Two other brothers, Issa Iqbal, 21, and Ismail Iqbal, 20, both of no fixed address, also face trafficking charges and will appear in court in November. Ricardo Hinkson, 23, from Radford, and Mia Mahmood, 27, and Tazvir Hussein, 30, 
both from Foles Hill, were all due to appear at Coventry Magistrates Court Friday charged with conspiracy to traffic for the purposes of sexual exploitation. Salim Hussein, 30, from Coventry, and Kazar Hussein, 25, from Stetchford, were also due to appear, charged with sexual assault and rape, respectively. Police said the five alleged victims were being supported by specially trained police officers and staff from Coventry City Council's Children's Services. World to date comments. You heard it from me years ago that it is usually a family affair and all these cases are bearing it out. There are at least one set of brothers or family members always involved in this type of grooming. Let's hope this lot get what they deserve, although I doubt it. They, after all, have human rights, don't they? Finally, Asian footballer jailed after racist tirade against match referee. An Asian amateur footballer has been sent to prison for subjecting a referee to a 20-minute racist rant as he was being sent off. Wazar Ahmed, 23, told Ian Fraser, I'm going to break every white bone in your white face. As other players and spectators looked on in shock, Ahmed raged, I'm going to burn your white house down and kill your wife and kids. I know where you live. I'm going to come and find your house. After the game finished, Ahmed stood near to Mr Fraser's car and stared at him as he got in. He was arrested soon after when the referee, who has 30 years' experience in officiating at to matches, went to the police station and made a formal complaint to officers and the East Lancashire Football League. Mr Fraser, 48, told police he had never known anything like it before, felt intimidated and was left extremely shocked. He said he feared further trouble because of the threats. World Date says... If it had been white on black racial abuse, someone in the crowd or one of the players would have reported it and videoed it there and then. Thank God Mr Fraser did it, although living in Lancashire he's right to be afraid. Be very afraid. This shows exactly what most, if not all Muslims, think of us. They view us as cattle and nothing more, whilst biting the hand that so often feeds them. Who is the greater fool? Arrested man whose mosque boom tattoo incites racial hatred. A man who allegedly revealed his tattoo of a mosque being blown up at an English Defence League rally in Birmingham has been arrested. Sean Rea of South Shields, South Tyneside, has been arrested on suspicion of inciting racial hatred. The 39-year-old was reportedly recently pictured lifting up his T-shirt to reveal an image of a Muslim place of worship with boom displayed across it. The picture was taken during a demonstration organised by the EDL in Birmingham City Centre on Saturday, July the 20th. A spokesman for West Midlands Police said, A 39-year-old man has been arrested in South Tyneside on behalf of West Midlands Police on suspicion of using words or behaviour or displaying written material with intent to stir up racial hatred. The image sparked outrage after it was posted online. It was taken at a demonstration in Birmingham, according to The Sun, where police made 20 arrests after officers came under attack on Saturday. The 20, a 20-year-old 20 woman has been charged with violent disorder and was due to appear in court earlier this week. A World Date writer has commented, If this guy has to lift his T-shirt to expose this tattoo, it's hardly in the public eye, is it? Even if it was, is this any worse than the hate preachers and the awful bin-bagged women who hold badly written racial and religious slurs to be seen by the public? Get real, this is a witch hunt. If a Muslim had the same thing about a church, the police would look the other way. Bad judgment goes both ways. Bank of England helped Reichsbank sell its Nazi gold. Tyler Durden, writing for Zero Hedge, says, We previously showed hard evidence of the Bank of England's complicit hiding of the truth about the quality of Bundesbank gold stored in the Fed's vaults. A few weeks later, in a completely unrelated action, the Bundesbank dramatically shifted its recent stance and demanded that its gold be repatriated into its own vaults. And we now know the impact that has had on the paper physical paper markets. However, in yet another one of the darkest episodes in central banking history, the FT reports, the Bank of England facilitated the sale of gold that was looted by the Nazis after their invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1938. Of course, judging today's central bankers by this ethical and potentially criminal behaviour of over 70 years ago is unfair, but it is notable that the pattern of whatever it takes and at all costs decisions, coupled with pervasive opacity and stark accountability, appear to have been formed a long time ago. World Date says, yes, much like the US taking the brightest and best of the Nazi elite into their country to work for them. There's no difference. Get over it. European News French deemed too lazy for Swiss recruiters. 
Swiss recruitment firms are shunning French candidates because they're deemed too lazy and arrogant and have a penchant for ringing in sick in Mondays and Fridays, according to reports in a Swiss newspaper this week. The French have come under the cosh for their work ethic in recent months. In February, outspoken American CEO Maurice Taylor accused French factory workers of spending most of their time at work talking. And now it is the turn of the Swiss to cast aspersions on how hard the French work. This week, a French paper provoked headlines and more soul-searching in France by claiming recruitment firms in the country are shunning the French because they are perceived to be too lazy and arrogant. Le Matin Dimanche reported the Swiss recruitment firms are including the requirement of Swiss or resident in Switzerland job adverts to avoid being inundated by French applicants. Germany. Oil under Brandenburg could deliver billions. Currently best known for not very much, the North German state of Brandenburg could soon be catapulted into an economic boom. A drilling firm reckons there are 92 million tonnes of oil there and plans to start drilling in the next four years. The economically depressed former East German state could benefit by nearly 7 billion euros, according to Central European Petroleum, CEP, which intends to start drilling in the Lausitz area, the Tagesspiegel newspaper reported on Thursday. A German-Canadian consortium, CEP, has found what it calls deposits of European significance at two sites between Lubin and Liberos in the Dan Speyweld region. It launched its plans to get the oil on Wednesday in Potsdam. Thomas Schroeter, CEO of the consortium, said drilling could start in 2017 and could bring up at least 15% of what is there over the coming 30 to 50 years. This would be around 10 million tonnes of oil. It is the best quality, sweet and low in sulphur, he said of the oil. It's no Persian Gulf, but despite that, it is an absolute hit. Currently, around 2.5 million tonnes of oil are drilled in Germany each year, largely in Lower Saxony and off the schleswig holstein coast, the paper said. And before reunification, drilling for oil was being carried out in Brandenburg. But this was dropped when East Germany ceased to exist. World Date says, if the commies had known about this, there'd be no united Germany now. Roll over Saudi and OPEC. Well, our Nick Griffin MEP is taking a holiday. So today, instead of a belly of the beast clever and informative report on the EU, you're getting me and the Mozar speak on the beast itself and the way in which the Robin Hood ethos is spreading out from the EU and contaminating all our lives. You may wonder how the EU influences the country and why it holds such a strong place in our governments and establishments. All the while the media is telling us that most of the rules and regulations, which we, or rather successive governments by the way, happily adopt, impinge on the British way of life and culture that has done us very well in past history, whilst not hitting on the basic fact that most of these laws are not brought into power with the UK in mind. The EU operates for Europe, not for Britain, in any sense of the word, unless it's taking money from us, giving us laws which either do us no good or are actually harmful to our economy, and of course sending us their poor and afflicted remnants from parts of Europe hitherto uncared for and ignored by the rest of that landmass. It is chilling in its rightness is that the EU the beast is established in Belgium, that country that has no proper function apart from chocolate, and that is really the remit of the Swiss. Belgium and the Belgians are neither French, Dutch nor German, but appear to be going the whole hog on being Islamic. The only Belgian person I know is a family member, although she wishes she wasn't. She speaks seven languages, loves multiculturalism and making money, hates nationalism in any form and doesn't want children, alias a true child of modern Europe, a walking, talking, working, barren machine, much like the European Parliament, full of promise at the beginning but never delivering very much at all. This is what Trist46 had to comment on about the EU. The EEC is what the people of this country agreed to do in the referendum, not the EU. The EEC was simply a mutual trade agreement and had nothing to do with governance. Contract law in this country states that if you change the conditions of a contract, it must be agreed to and signed again. We agreed and signed up to the EEC via the referendum. They then changed the conditions of the contract and the EEC became the EU, but we were never asked to agree to sign the new contract. On these grounds, any contractual ties to the EU are null and void by law. The government have committed an illegal act by allowing the EU to control this country, contrary to the wishes of the people. In effect, this country is not actually a member of the EU. He or she might well have a point there, as successive governments have lauded and accommodated various and many illegal EU rulings. 
I voted for the EEC mainly for trade, not to have my country overrun with strangers and even stranger rules and laws. This could also be why UKIP was invented and funded by the establishment, because it would be a thorn in the side of rising nationalism, whilst at the same time doing absolutely nothing within the EU but treat it as a cash cow. It's not for nothing that the pound sign is the emblem of UKIP. They might as well have Shylock with his pound of flesh on their rosettes overlaid with the EU flag. William Hague, Mr Fetus is my nickname for him, has made an interesting point. It couldn't really be enforced, which of course is the whole point. I quote, The EU needs a red card system for national parliaments to block laws passed in Brussels if they think EU officials are going too far. The UK Foreign Secretary William Hague said in a speech in a meeting held in Berlin in May this year. As with the yellow card system, this proposal would require a minimum number of national parliaments to agree in order to take effect so a single government would not be able to ignore directives if disagreed with. Matt's person of the Open Europe think tank said, allowing national parliaments to block unwanted EU law would go a long way to bring back democratic accountability over EU decisions. Take human rights, and as far as I'm concerned, you can. The Human Rights Act does not exist, because most of the people it's applied to are only human owing to the fact of having two arms, two legs, walking fairly upright and not being covered in hair. If being human is them, then that says a lot for animals. We in this country did not have to adopt this act into our laws. In fact, there are many EU laws which we could just reject and ignore. We pay our money, we should be able to take our choice, but no. And this is where the Robin Hood people's mentality kicks in. Virtual mob rule by proxy. I will read a section of the Human Rights Act. The Human Rights Act 1998 is an Act of Parliament of the United Kingdom which received royal assent on 9th of November 1998 and mostly came into force on the 2nd of October 2000. Its aim is to give further effect in the UK law to the rights contained in the Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, but more commonly known as the European Convention on Human Rights. The Act makes it available in the UK courts as a remedy for breach of a convention right without the need to go to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. However, if it is not possible to interpret an Act of Parliament so as to make it compatible with the Convention, the judges are not allowed to override it. All they can do is issue a declaration of incompatibility. This declaration does not affect the validity of the Act of Parliament. In that way, the Human Rights Act seeks to maintain the principle of parliamentary sovereignty, see Constitution of the United Kingdom. However, judges may strike down secondary legislation as long as the legislation does not derive its power from primary legislation. Under the Act, individuals retain the right to sue in the Strasbourg Court. All in all, once taken on board, there's nothing you can do about this Act and its web. Remember, we British do not have the Human Rights Act on our side. We cannot plead that we are indigenous to this country because the European Parliament has declared that we are a nation of immigrants and no one in the UK can claim their indigenous human rights as well as can newcomers from their own lands claim equal or more than equal rights over us and our laws once they are on UK soil. Which brings us to a case which is typical of the ECHR stranglehold within the UK. Police won't hand stolen caravan back to couple to protect human rights of the travellers living in it. A couple whose £30,000 caravan was stolen had been told a traveller family now living in it cannot be removed because it would breach their human rights. Kathleen McClelland and her partner Michael Curry spent their life savings on the top of the range camper and were devastated when it vanished from the secure site where they kept it. When the police eventually found the 26-foot-long Bailey, Louisiana caravan 18 months later, its owners were told a traveller couple and their two young children were living in it only 10 miles from their home in Surrey. Their initial relief turned to outrage, however, when the police said they had no lawful powers to get it back. They were told their only option was to begin costly civil proceedings against the family, which they say they cannot afford. Mrs McLennan and Mr Curry had spent £10,000 improving the £20,000 caravan, including putting in a widescreen TV. They bought the vehicle on hire purchase and still have to make monthly payments of £250 for the next two years. Hospital ward clerk McClellan, Mrs McLennan, 68, said, Why should we have to pay for someone else to live in our brand new caravan? That was for our pleasure in our older years. 
The police said that removing the family would breach their human rights and that they would have to be rehoused before it could be seized. We spent all our retirement money on that caravan because we thought it would last us a lifetime. We're absolutely devastated. It seems as though no one cares about our human rights. I've worked all my life and saved up. Surely I have the right to enjoy my retirement. When that caravan was stolen, our right to a happy retirement was stolen. The couple who live in a semi-detached home in Tongham, Surrey, were in between insurance policies at the time of the theft in 2011, so were not covered for a payout. In an apologetic letter, PC Karen East of Hampshire Constabulary told them the matter was out of the force's hands. It read, Unfortunately, it has transpired that we have no lawful power to recover the caravan. It will be the responsibility of you as the owner to start civil proceedings against the current occupier. The letter added, I sincerely apologise for this decision and I am sure that you feel the onus has been put back to you but my hands have been tied due to police powers. Mr Curry, 53, who gave up his job as an HGV driver after being diagnosed with diabetes said the police refused to reveal the caravan's exact location. This is disgusting but there are many more stories similar or worse in which the actual criminals cannot be moved, arrested or prosecuted because of their human rights not the rights of the people who have been robbed, raped, beaten or murdered. The EU have taken away our rights for perpetuity. It's human rights that gave the murderers of Charlene Downs money for their trauma, not a peerage for her mother. It's the human rights of terrorists and hateful strangers in our midst that overtakes the so-called rights of you, the British people. The law is not on our side at all. Once you tie the hands of the judicial system in a country and reduce its armed forces, you get a totalitarian state. In the real world, this couple should be able to legally evict these travellers, regardless of their human rights, regardless of their ethnicity or religion. They are in receipt of stolen goods, and that is not legal in any country. Take a case from the 70s in US Alabama. There were 1,700 used cars sold to Alabama residents through legitimate dealers discovered to have been stolen from the northern states by gangs. Federal agents seized the cars and returned them to their rightful owners in the north. The Alabama residents had no recourse as they had purchased stolen property, which is a crime. Obviously one which the Human Rights Act condones, as the EU condones illegal migrants, camping in or out of stolen homes or land, raping and grooming children of the host country, murdering and beating the inhabitants of that country, all of which have no human rights themselves. In short, bring in the dogs and heavies and get them out, much like the squatters in private property, much like the Romas who camp and shit everywhere, in fact where there are humans who do not deserve the right that other humans have worked so hard to obtain. Human rights, like citizenship, should be earned not taken. Put this with the Robin Hood mentality of many of the people, the take from the rich and give to the poor nonsense. You have true communism, not democracy, and the EU is a communist regime by any other name. It even has its own army. Yes, it does. On looking up this fact, all I could get was this Wikipedia text. On 20th February 2009, the European Parliament voted yes to create SAFE, Synchronised Armed Forces Europe, as a first step towards a true European military force. SAFE will be directed by an EU directorate with its own training standards and operational doctrine. There are also plans to create an EU Council for Defence Ministers and a European Statute for Soldiers within the framework of SAFE governing training standards, operational doctrine and freedom of operational action. But I did receive another fact that they are operating in Greece at the moment and they are armed. It's an old posting by Golem in October 2011. Did you know the EU has its own riot police that can operate in any European country, but is answerable directly to none of them? No, I didn't either. They are called the European Gendarmery Force, Eurogen4. They are based in Italy, but funded and staffed by six signatory nations who are France, Italy, Holland, Spain, Portugal and Romania. However, according to the treaty which established Eurogen, they can operate in any EU country and are available to others who invite them to do so. The country which invites them in is referred to as the host. The gendarmerie are specifically set up to deal with riots and civil unrest and as the treaty spells out, they are to be exclusively comprising elements of police forces with military status. 
There is a picture of the force. How many police forces or even riot police do you know who drill with bayonets? The force is 3,000 strong based in Italy, composed of two rapid deployment brigades. Since Greece is not a member of Eurogend, for few if any of its troops officers will speak Greek. Yet they may now be operating in Greece. I've checked with friends in Athens and they're telling me it is true. Now it is alleged that a non-Greek militarised riot force may have arrived to enforce austerity. Whose bidding would they really be doing? Whose interests would they be serving? Could it be the banks? Of course, this is not how Eurogend was set up. I know that. But this is how it actually works, nevertheless. There are also several web pages devoted to the increased military spend to solve the EU debt crisis, which is the nearest I can get to whether they're actually in Greece or not. Regardless, the EU is on the move to consolidate its money and has formed a force, perhaps to control the countries that do or do not provide it with funds. The attitude of a majority of our own people impedes the march of true nationalism in this country and the ridding of the EU, the Robin Hood debacle, the People's People Brigade. Wake up, there is no such thing any more than there was a people's princess. Bless poor old Diana, there was a media ploy and a very clever one. There are few real working class people left. The backbone of England as they truly were are now calling themselves middle class and sport fair sized houses, holidays, cars and most if not all still send their kids to state comprehensives. Now I've been rich and poor. I've had struggles like the so-called working class mums and that doesn't make me a heroine, it just makes me human. True, I haven't worked down a mine, but then neither have a vast majority of Brits. There's no taking from the rich and giving to the poor now. There is just a vast army of idiots, both foreign and domestic, who think that by stealing, occupying and taking over other people's hard-earned property, they are giving to the poor. No, they are taking from the average guy and keeping it themselves. And they are ably aided by the EU Human Rights Act. We have foreigners in this country who think nothing of taking advantage of anything and everything going, and if not legal, they will take it illegally and still not be touched by the law. It's down to us, the normal man and woman in this country, to impose our own laws if the right laws are not being imposed for us. The sooner we leave the EU, the better, although of course the Belgium thinks we would not last a year if we came out, but consider the source of that statement. We would last, it would be hard, but we would be forced to become more independent and return our country to the once great industrial and self-sufficient farming state it was. Remember Britain was great when it had a preponderance of British people in it and no interference from Europe. We at least could hold our heads up and say that mistakes we made were ours and not some strangers. Which would you rather have? It's in your hands now. World News State Iran TV, Rouhani's comments on Israel removal were distorted. Iranian state television said on Friday reports quoting Iran's president-elect Hassan Rouhani as calling Israel a wound that needs to be removed were distorted. News agencies distort Iran press-elect Rouhani's remarks on Quds Day, said a breaking news caption on Press TV. Earlier on Friday, Iranian news agencies reported the cleric Rouhani, who will be inaugurated on Sunday, had described the Zionist regime as a wound that has sat on the body of the Muslim world for years and needs to be removed. The quote by Press TV was later corrected too. After all, in our region there's been a wound for years on the body of the Muslim world under the shadow of the occupation of the Holy Land of Palestine and the beloved city of Al-Quds. Rouhani won a landslide victory in Iran's June the 14th presidential election. He replaces Mahmoud Ahmadinejad on Sunday. World Date states, I would go further. I would say that Islam is a parasite on the rump of a hyena and should be removed to its rightful place, out of Europe. Egypt Army Restoring Democracy, says John Kerry. US Secretary of State John Kerry has said Egypt's military was restoring democracy when it ousted elected President Mohamed Morsi last month. Mr Kerry said the removal was at the request of millions and millions of people. His remarks came as, a police, as police prepared to disperse two pro morsi sit-ins in the capital, Cairo. Egypt's interior ministry has promised Mr Morsi's supporters safe exit if they quickly leave the camps. The country's cabinet on Wednesday ordered police to end the protests, calling them a national security threat. Asked to intervene, Washington has refused to describe Mr Morsi's removal as a coup. Doing so would require the US government to cut off its estimated $1.5 billion in annual aid to Egypt. Correspondents say Mr Kerry's latest comments will be seen in Egypt as supportive of the interim government. In a television interview in Pakistan, 
Mr Kerry said the military were asked to intervene by millions and millions of people, all of whom were afraid of a descendants into chaos, into violence. And the military did not take over to the best of our judgment so far. To run the country, there's a civilian government. In effect, they were restoring democracy. World at Eight says, well, excuse me. As much as I disliked Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood, he was at least elected. The Egyptian army and you, Mr Kerry, were not. And finally, to finish on a high note, a joke. And please note, I am mocking the afflicted here. This maybe is an old joke, but it is the old ones that are the best. There was a preacher doing the rounds in the Deep South. His metier was brimstone and hell the coming of. However, at one of his meetings, he decided the power of the Lord had entered him and he could heal the sick. He called on those in his congregation who were afflicted to come forward. After a short wait, a man came forward with a terrible hair, lip and cleft palate, which had been clearly left untreated. The preacher looked at him and said, So, my brother, are you afflicted? Yes, replied the man. And the preacher said, And I see you have an affliction of the mouth. Yes, I do, said the man. Well, my brother, said the preacher, go behind the screen up on the stage and I and the Lord will heal you. So the man walked behind the screen. At that moment, an awful shuffling and scraping was heard and from the audience lurched a man who could barely walk. His back and legs were twisted and the only things holding him up were his crutches. The preacher was filled with pity and asked if he wanted to be cured. The man gesticulated because he had lost the power of speech as well. The preacher told him to go behind the screen with the other afflicted man and wait. There followed a spate of preaching and exhortations to the Lord to heal both these men. The preacher called on God and Jesus to place their hands on his poor brothers and take away their afflictions. Oh yes, echoed the congregation. Oh yes, praise the Lord, praise him. After the prayers and exhortations were finished and the congregation had calmed down, the preacher called out to the worst afflicted man, Throw away your right crutch, brother. And there was a clatter from the screen. Throw away your left crutch, brother. Thence another clatter, and then an awful crash was heard. The preacher called, Oh, my brother, are you cured? Has the Lord thy God come into you? Has he taken away your crippled legs and straightened your twisted back? After a slight scuffle behind the screen, a voice was heard. No, preacher, he's fallen over. Sorry. You've been listening to The World at Eight. I'm Lynn Mozart. And I and the team and Radio Britain wish you all a very happy, safe and cool weekend.